All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and talk about Chapter 10, 10.1, the Kinetic Molecular Theory. Now, the Kinetic Molecular Theory, um, to kind of understand of it, the, the basics of it, you kind of have to look at the name. And where kinetic is dealing with movement. Okay, molecular, we're dealing with molecules. So we're dealing with the movement of the molecules. Now, it's based on the idea that the particles are constantly moving. Okay, particles in a gas. Okay, they're constantly moving. But also, particles in a solid and liquid move as well. They just move slower. Okay, now this provides a model of ideal gas behavior, so it's only an approximation. It's a model. It's not specifically exact. Now, when applied to gases, there are five assumptions that we have to make okay, to I, for an ideal gas. Now the first one, gases consist of tiny particles that are very far apart. Okay, the particles being the molecules. Okay, most of the volume is empty space, so if we look here, in between the molecules, the majority of it is empty space. In solids and liquids, these molecules are much closer together so there's a lot of less empty space. But in a gas, an empty space is the majority of the volume. It's very low density and allow gases to be easily compressed. Second assumption is that all collisions between particle con particles and container walls are elastic. Okay? Meaning, elastic collision means there's not a loss of energy. If we look here at this picture, we see that as the vol drops and hits the ground, it comes back up, but it doesn't come back up to the original starting point. It's a little lower. And then it comes up to the top, back down again, and again, it continues to get lower. An elastic collision is where you don't have a loss of energy. If this was an elastic collision, this ball would be at the same height. Now, the total kinetic energy will stay constant, and energy can be transferred between particles. Now, particles are in continuous, rapid, random motion. Continuous meaning they never stop, rapid meaning they are moving very fast, and random motion meaning they're going in every different direction. And we see here in this picture, these little red dots are considered to be molecules. And they're moving very fast and they're moving in all different directions. And what they do is, for us to have a gas, we have to have a container. In that container, what happens is as those molecules hit the sides of the wall, it creates pressure. And we'll talk about pressure in just a little bit. Now, no forces of, of attraction or repulsion, meaning when the molecules hit each other, they merely bounce off. They don't stick to each other. Okay? They don't clump up. They hit and they bounce apart like billiard balls. And our fifth assumption is that the average kinetic energy depends on temperature. Kinetic energy of move, is movement, so if we increase the temperature, we increase the kinetic energy. Okay, kinetic energy equals one half the mass times velocity squared. Okay, so at the same temperature, lighter particles have higher speeds than heavier ones. Light things move faster than heavier things. You can think about an example of football players. A running back is lighter than a lineman, so a running back will run faster than a lineman will. Now, ideal versus real gases. Ideal gases are defined according to the kinetic molecular theory. Real gases do not behave exactly according to the kinetic molecular theory. Ideal gases are perfect gases. When you see ideal, you think perfect. You think unchangeable. Okay? They're exactly the same. Ideal gases will behave exactly the way you want them every single time. But in the real world, real gases, they don't behave exactly according to the kinetic molecular theory. Now, most gases will behave close to ideal or close to perfect when they're at very high temperatures so that they have enough kinetic energy to overcome attractive forces and very low pressures so they're really, really spread out. Now, gases with little attraction 
are more ideal, meaning they'll act more perfectly. Monatomic gases. Now, getting into 10.2, we're now talking about pressure. Now, pressure is the force per unit area on a surface. The equation for this is pressure equals force divided by area. A newton is the SI unit for force. Now, pressure, as the surface area decreases, pressure increases. Pressure exerted by a gas depends on volume, temperature, and the number of molecules. When we think of pressure, what we want to think of is that pressure, just like we said before, are the molecules hitting the sides of the container. Okay? So obviously our volume will be the sides of the container. Temperature will be how fast those molecules are moving, how much kinetic energy they have. And the number of molecules would be the amount of gas that we have. Okay? So if we have less of an area, that means the molecules are going to hit the wall more often. If we have a higher temperature, that means they're moving faster, so they're bouncing off the walls at a greater rate. And if we have more molecules, then obviously more things are hitting the wall, so we have more pressure. Now, the way we measure pressure, we measure atmospheric pressure with a barometer. Okay? Barometer was, the first one created was by Torticelli in the early 1600s. Okay, you can read about that on page 310. Here's an example of a barometer. As we see the, um, the atmosphere is pushing down on the mercury, and it's measured in millimeters of mercury. And 760 is standard atmospheric pressure, the pressure at sea level. Now, another way to measure pressure is a manometer. It measures pressure of a gas in a container. Okay. Gas has less pressure. If the gas has less pressure than the atmosphere, if the mercury is closer to the chamber. If it's farther away from the chamber, then the gas has more pressure than the atmosphere. We'll see an example of it here. We see that the mercury is very close to the chamber. So the gas pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure. And if we see the mercury is farther away, then the gas pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure. So, if the atmosphere pushes down more than the pressure of the gas pushes down here, then it's less. If the pressure inside the gas pushes more here, going down, than the atmosphere on the outside, then obviously it's greater. Now the units of pressure. Pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury. That's from the mercury barometer in TORS, which is named after Torticelli, and atmospheres of pressure, which is ATM, and Pascal's, which is the SI unit for pressure. Our conversion factor that we'll need to work everything, this is very important, make sure we star highlight it. Do something, write this down. One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury, which equals 760 TOR, which equals 101.325 kilopascals. Now, we can use this and we convert between pressures, okay? If we have 0.927 atmospheres, we can convert it to millimeters of mercury. All we do is we start with atmospheres. We can see our box right here. We set it up. We put atmospheres on the bottom because it matches the unit. And we put millimeters of mercury on the top. We're getting this from our conversion factor, what we wrote down from the last slide. Okay, so if we want to change it to TOR, all we have to do is put atmospheres on the bottom, TOR on the top. And if we want to go to Pascal's, we put atmospheres on the bottom and uh, kilopascal's on the top. Multiply it out, and we'll get our answer. Another example of this, if we want to convert 148.6 kilopascal's to atmospheres, well, we write down what we start with. This is the unit for kilopascal's which equals one atmosphere. Multiply the top, divide by the bottom, and we have atmospheres. If we want it in millimeters of mercury, this is what kilopascals equals, which also equals 760 millimeters of mercury. Multiply the top, divide by the bottom. And very last, tors. 
we want to take it, we put kilopascals on the bottom, torres on the top, and multiply it out. 